wish we had sound in the auditorium. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, that's, that's an example of a bigger tree. What was that? <coughs> That's one of the bigger trees. We like hardwood trees because they stick around for a long time. They provide good habitat. Do one more for me, Scott. This is another video. So now you can kind of pretend you're a crappie. I'm going to take you right into the tree. And this is where you really start to see the benefit. This is just one tree. Look at how much complex branching is there. Look how much surface area is on this one tree. That's all going to get covered in algae and bugs. And that's going to be eaten by little fish. And those little fish are going to be eaten by big fish, and those big fish are going to be eaten by you. That's the idea here. We are creating not just structural fish habitat, but we are also creating food for this, this incredible ecosystem. So, uh, one more for me, Scott. This is the map that shows where the work has been done. The yellow shaded shorelines are what we did in 2018. The pink shorelines are actually what we did in 2019. So, uh, we kind of have two phases to this project. Uh, that total 922 total trees. So that's a, that's a big number. And again, we're able to do that because of the help of all our foresters and all the saws we have running out there. So one more for me, please. So we do our winter projects, kind of timing everything so that when April rolls around, we're ready to go on the field. The problem was the field was not ready for us in April of 2018. Um, we were still locked up tight in all the lakes, snow covered, waiting, waiting, waiting. So. Um, I can kind of show you how odd this is, although it's not feeling as odd anymore because odd is the new normal. What this figure shows is ice out records from Whitefish Lake, which have been kept since the 1970s by Ken Zeroth. That line running right through the middle, that zero line, that's April 17th. Any bars that go above that are an ice out date that was later than April 17th. Any bars that go below that is an ice out date that's earlier than April 17th. So it's hard to pick out a lot of you know, real defined patterns here. It's not that ice out is earlier every single year now than it used to be, but give me one tap, Scott. If you look at this and you throw this bar up here, you see that from the 70s through the 80s and the early 90s, ice out pretty much always happened in a fairly narrow span of time that was plus or minus about 10 days from April 17th. Then things started getting weirder, and they started falling outside of that range more and more often. Not always earlier, not always later, but sometimes much earlier, and sometimes much later. Um, that's a problem if you are a specialist species like a walleye or a perch. You spawn at a very specific time and a very specific temperature, and you're expecting that to happen at about April 17th. And when it happens on March 12th, or happens on May 5th, uh, your eggs may not be fully developed or uh, there may be other problems associated with spawning. And that's one of the reasons our researchers are saying species like walleye and perch are struggling a little bit because we have this inconsistency now. And this is what climate change looks like here in Sawyer County. This isn't a weather station somewhere in the Arctic or anything like that. This is ice out records right here from our lakes showing that things are different than they used to be. Go ahead, Scott. So we had to go back to the office and find more projects. So we decided to uh, revisit some data from a tagging study that was done in the Chippewa Flowage with muskies from the late 70s into the 80s. Uh, this was something that was initiated and, and run by guides. Frank, of course, was certainly involved in that. And what they were doing is they were individually tagging fish, and every fish that was caught or recaught was being put onto a, a big complex grid map. And that's what interested me the most, because we can go back and look at this now with some of the modern tools that we have available, and we can kind of remap some of the things that they found and, and put a, a modern you know, uh, visualization on it. Go ahead, Scott. So this map shows where all the fish were reported to be caught. And I say reported because I've heard some people grumble that there might have been some shenanigans and maybe people weren't reporting fish to where they were actually caught. We're going to take it at face value here and assume that this is what was actually happening. I'm sure for the large part that's true. There may have been a couple you know, erroneous records somewhere. But the bigger brighter dots show where more fish were caught, and the smaller, lighter colored dots show where less fish were caught. This is kind of a novelty thing. From a research standpoint, this doesn't mean a ton, because we don't know how much effort happened at any of these spots. You know, Pete's Bar might have gotten fished for 10,000 hours, while some random spot up on the north side of Moss Creek may not have been fished at all. Does that mean Pete's Bar is a better spot than that other one? We can't say for sure. But this is still interesting, and I know anglers love this kind of stuff. We wrote a Muskie Hunter article detailing some of these results, uh, so you can maybe find that on the web, I'm not sure. One more for me, Scott. 
But this is the stuff I was really interested in, was this, how are fish moving about? Um, so what we did is we went through those records and we found all the times <coughs> where a single fish was caught twice in the same summer, June, July, August. Each of these arrows is a fish. The base of the arrow is the first time they were caught, or where they were caught the first time, and the tip of the arrow is where they were caught the second time. So what we see here is a lot of smallish movements, a little under a mile typically, uh, and they're all pretty much staying within their general basin. We don't see a lot of big east to west or running up and down the channel, the Crane Lake, or anything like that. They're staying pretty tight, which is what we know about musky biology in the summer. Compare that to the next slide, which is movements from fish caught in the summer and then caught again in the fall. And here the movements get big, and they get a lot more um, diffuse, where they're going all across the flowage, they're going east to west, they're going from you know, Milwaukee Bay up into Hay Lake, they're going from Scott Lake up into Crane, so there's a lot more big movements as they're looking for that place where they're going to spend the winter. And if you think about the triple foliage in the 70s and 80s, big drawdowns were the norm. They had to get to deep water, basically, uh, if they were going to make it through the winter. So, some interesting stuff here. One more, Scott. This is just statistics you can impress your friends with, if you can remember them. Okay. So, from this whole project, um, of all the fish we looked at, almost 90% of them stayed within that same basin, 89% roughly. So they either stayed on the east or stayed on the west and never crossed over, at least according to the, the capture records. About 9% did switch, made that trip under the bridge. 2% of the fish that were tagged in the lake were recaptured underneath the dam. Um, it's hard to say if that's a reliable estimate of the actual number going over the dam or the actual percentage. Uh, there was almost 1,700 total fish that were caught as a part of this project with an average length of just under 35 inches. And of all those fish, over eight years, there was only one 50 caught and only 11% over 40 inches. And that's probably the biggest change in our muskie populations from this point in time to today, whether you're talking about the flowage or teal lost land or anywhere, is the size structure has been marching upwards. And catch and release plays a really big role in that. So, uh, certainly if we did a krill project over eight years on the chip today, uh, we would expect a much higher average length and percentage over 40, and we would certainly hope that there would be more than one 50 caught during an eight-year span. But these are some of the best anglers, you know, ever to fish the flows, too. All right, so we're going to leave that project. This will be another